is Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello and welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Thank you for joining me today. I am going to deviate from the Theology of Worship series and discuss a matter that has arisen in recent years, uh, particularly in Southern Baptist life. That is elder-led church polity. Elder-led church polity. It's theology, it's practice, and we're going to, uh, to discuss that and form an interplay between congregationalist rule and elder-led rule. Maybe you attend an elder-led church. Maybe it's not too familiar. I grew up a Southern Baptist, and it was not very common in the denomination that I grew up in. But it is, I believe, the most biblical model of church polity. And so we're going to discuss that, um, uh, the biblical model of elder-led rule. And uh, in doing so, I'm going to present a case for elder-led rule. So the the interplay between congregationalist rule and elder-led rule in local churches, especially in the United States, has seemingly increased in recent decades, so much so that churches are increasingly making a transition from congregationalist rule to rule by a plurality of elders. Uh, This transition often seems and proves to be a daunting task, uh, but a necessary one to conform to New Testament standards. So here I'm going to contend for a church polity that is led by a plurality of elders, uh, this model most closely aligns with the biblical model. The New Testament doesn't disclose a single correct polity, but without being explicit, paints a broad stroke in its support for elder-led leadership. And so for manifold reasons, um, direction of a, by a body of elders affords multiple benefits for the local church. First, elder-led polity is a joint responsibility, which naturally yields greater accountability among leaders. Second, as an extension of the local church body, an elder-led model most accurately pr- portrays the body of Christ. And third, the elder-led model is a tried-and-true method for local church leadership and has been employed since the the early church. If God's people desire to conform to the New Testament model, the elder-led model works best. So here I am going to oppose the commonly employed model in Western culture, the congregationalist model, by presenting two common issues that arise in congregationalism. Uh, First of all, there is little accountability, and secondly, too much responsibility placed upon one person. And so in the the interaction between both models, the elder-led model will be met with staunch biblical standards and biblical support. So the case for the elder-led model, number one, The elder-led polity is a joint responsibility. It is a plurality of elders. Now, I'm going to get into this a little bit. There are a couple of ways to employ an elder-led model. Uh, One is a plurality of elders, and two is uh, a model where... Uh, the elders function as the leaders of the church. They make the decisions. An elder-led model of leadership works well, largely because the church is overseen by a plurality of elders. 
So that is the model I am supporting here. A plurality of elders. The biblical responsibility of eldership extends to local congregations of the people of God. Elders were an integral part of synagogue hierarchy. An elder could have been a benefactor in a synagogue, or it might have even been one of its founders. And in an age where culture increasingly uh, seems to stand against authority where they may, polity matters, especially in that which conforms to biblical models. Admittedly, elder-led church polity is not the the one and only model of of a biblical organization. Uh, For example, Christ has granted liberty to the church in how how she is to properly function. But for manifold reasons, the model works. I'm going to give you four primary reasons here the model works. Elder-led church, an elder-led church tends to be more effective than, than other models. Uh, number one, a plurality of elders is a joint effort with greater accountability and less opportunity for abuse of power. Number two, the efficacy of pastoral equipping is enhanced. And number three, uh, sorry, there are three primary reasons, not four primary reasons, Um, Number three, in an elder-led model, the tasks of the church are handed to the saints for the work of ministry. That's Ephesians 4. Uh, The work of ministry is given to the saints. Here, the the tasks of the church are given to the saints. Biblical eldership takes on multiple meanings. Uh, For example, in the Old Testament scriptures, As representatives of the people, the congregation and the whole congregation and the elders of the congregation took on the same meaning. So when you read the Old Testament and you see uh, the elders of the congregation and the whole congregation, that means the same thing. And this is a broad perspective, but one needs to consider what's implied uh, in the office of a biblical elder. Numerous passages in the New Testament indicate the words elder. Um, There are three different words. Um, Presbyteros, uh, episkopos, and the word pastor, poinon, um, all refer refer to the same office. Uh, You can... Um, figure out which terms are derived from those. Uh, pres- uh, presbyteros, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Episcopus, Episcopal, and Pastor. Um, they refer to the same thing. In other words, overseers and pastors are not distinct from elders. The terms are simply different ways of identifying the same people. In every case, Scripture refers to elders in a plural sense. In other words, a unified body of leaders rather than a single person from which a hierarchy flows. It's popular today to have a senior pastor. This is not a, not a biblical mo- model. Uh, not wrong. Uh, there is no explicit command against it. But... As such, the responsibility of eldership is is one that's combined, and it yields multiple benefits. A primary advantage of the elder-led model is greater accountability. In the elder-led model, uh, there exists less, uh, less opportunities for abuse of power, since a safeguard against such is built in the plural board of leaders. Scripture is clear on the exceeding qualifications of elders, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. Uh, So the role is not to be taken lightly, and even the Apostle Paul says such. So in theory, one who is an elder uh, will have been vetted for character and preparedness, but moreover, in an elder-led model, 
the process of vetting is more conducive than other models. In other words, an elder may, may be brought up in a particular local church and already known by her congregants. In an elder-led model, most often the church is led by a plurality of the elders rather than a single individual. They have equal weight. They have equal say. And so as such, not only does the congregation hold its board of elders accountable, the board of elders itself holds one another accountable. So it's a twofold accountability process. So there are less opportunities for abuse of power. In an elder-led model, significant decisions regarding the ministry of the local church uh, flow through a plurality of elders so that one person does not hold the weight of such decisions. Additionally, uh, studies have been shown uh, that churches who have elder-led models experience better health, unity, experienced less conflict, and had more uh, trust from their congregations. Uh, perhaps this is attributed to the plural nature of eldership rather than a singular, a singular person making weighty decisions. Elders serve as representatives of the congregation. So therefore, when, when there subsists a conflict, among the board of elders, decisions are often not made until the body has reached a consensus. An elder-led model yields greater potential for pastoral equipping in ministry. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, the Apostle Paul attests that pastors hold the ministry of equipping for the saints of the work uh, for the work of ministry. Ephesians four. So while some interpret work of ministry as a primary function of pastors, um, the context really suggests that pastors function as equippers so that the saints or congregants um, achieve the unity of the faith. As such, equipping the saints should be considered of utmost importance. Pastoral ministry involves equipping. Without claiming that elders are exempt from the work of ministry, they're not, um, congreg congregants cannot serve in the local church if they, if they are not equipped. Pa pastoral ministry involves equipping. A plurality of elders allows for greater opportunity to equip. Elders are given over to the flock to whom they have been called, according to Hebrews 13. So this is not an authority to intimidate, but an authority to empower and equip the church for ministry. Based on the premise that the word of God is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, 2 Timothy 3, Pastoral equipping ministry is derived from the authority of Scripture, the tool God has offered his people for such a purpose. Elders possess disparate gifts. Each elder has different gifts, different qualities, different abilities, and God intends to use those for, for his glory in the work of ministry. So a plurality of elders bids greater potential to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that the local churches are, are fully equipped are fully equipped and, and may function as God designed. A plural eldership multiplies the number of equipped leaders serving the church because there are, are more people equipping. Additionally, Men that feel called to pursue eldership but have difficulty as a sole leader tend to excel on a leadership team, thereby providing leadership opportunities that were not there previously because it is a, a plurality of elders. They contribute their individual giftings and callings to the work of ministry, to equipping for the work of ministry. So the overarching consensus of Scripture 
seemingly points to an elder-led model with the, without explicitly conveying a one and only biblical model. New Testament representations lean heavily toward the concept of an elder-led church policy. As a plurality of elders, greater accountability exists well as a greater as well as a greater employment of elders to whom local churches have been given. The local church has been given uh, the office of the elder for the equipping of ministry. So Christian origins hold their roots in the apostolic acts of the New Testament. <clears throat> so therefore, the models implemented, implemented by the modern church should adhere as best as possible to the models from the early church. One such model is an elder-led model, elder-led church leadership. God's design for elders to lead his people effectively and efficiently. And the contention here is that um, as the most, most prominent biblical model, an, an elder-led church polity should be employed in the local church. All right, the second uh, support for an elder-led model is that elder-led church polity most accurate, accurately portrays the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul discusses unity in the body of Christ extensively, even presenting uh, the church in terms of a literal human body in Ephesians 4. As such, the body of Christ is to function as a single unit comprised of many individuals. On a smaller scale, elders should function in the same manner. Elders may be viewed as representatives of the body and in doing so, an extension of the body. So elders should portray the body of Christ operationally. Unity in the body of Christ is a perpetual fact and something not to be achieved because is because it is it has already been uh, been achieved. Uh, that's Tertullian. T Tertullian believed so much in the unity of the body that he believed that the the unity in the body of Christ cannot be achieved because it has already been achieved. So at every level, unity should be displayed, including with its body of elders. Of the benefits of an elder-led model, significance exists, number one, in the display of unity, and number two, an even distribution of responsibility among local church leaders. And so, in this manner, an elder-led model most accurately portrays the body of Christ. An elder-led model firstly portrays the body of Christ in its display of unity. As the body of Christ is unified, so, so also are its board of elders. The biblical concept of eldership includes oversight. In other words, no matter which Greek term is utilized, it is the inherent responsibility of, of elders to provide leadership of local churches. As an extension of the local church, elder decision, decisions should reflect the will of God through the people of God on a smaller scale. Nonetheless, elder decisions could be considered God's visible, visible work working among his people, uh, but magnified in a magnified manner because leadership should stem from the Spirit's work in the local church. In other words, congregants are not exempt from the work of ministry. Elders are, are given to equip and the saints for the work of ministry. One might consider instances of what seems to be disunity in the church and wonder how such cases exemplify the unity of Christ. Unity, however, does not imply agreeing on everything with all brothers and sisters in Christ. Rather, unity means keeping um, living in peace. 
In other words, live harmoniously with everyone as best as possible. Living in unity uh, with brothers, with sisters, um, is predicated upon a harmony with one another that may only come from the Holy Spirit. In other words, we give liberty where we need to give liberty. Where such unity is not present, God's people do not represent who they are in the Spirit. The church's weekly worship gathering is a comprehensive demonstration of the unity that only exists in the, in the church. Words uh, play a peculiarly important role in contrast to the primitive worship where the action is dominant and the word seems to have little role at all. Because faith comes by hearing, the word must be, must be proclaimed, in other words, and secondly, because in words is the, uh, the specifically human way by which man makes known to himself and to others that he has received the word. Each, each week, God's people are equipped to serve uh, by those that God has placed among local church uh, local churches for the world role of equipping. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the ro- word of God, Romans 10, 17. At a mi- uh, macro level then, unity is revealed in corporate worship as the body of Christ endeavors to worship. And at a micro level, unity is re- revealed as the body of, e- of elders equips the saints for the work of ministry and leads the congregation in doing so. A second significant way in which the elder-led model accurately portrays the body of Christ is by its even distribution of responsibility among local church leaders. Delegation is nothing new in the design of God. In fact, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, instructs him in Exodus 18 to delegate roles to people to alleviate the responsibility and and the pressure in which he took. Uh, Moses was exhausted. If you read the account in Exodus 18, Moses was tired. He was exhausted. Jethro saw it and he said, listen, You need to delegate responsibility. The church as a singular organism or body is not designed to do life alone. God's people are to function as one body. Even in disagreement, the body is to function in harmony with one another. As an extension of the local church, the board of elders is to also function in harmony with one another. The local church should not be tasked to make every single decision on their own, which is why elders exist. To lead and oversee the church in governing decisions. That's why the elders exist. Nonetheless, because the body has vetted and scrutinized the board of elders, they are trusted with the ecclesiastical authority to meet, to make leadership decisions concerning the ministry of the church. In an elder-led model, a persistent difficulty is determining what to do with the board of deacons if such exists. Uh, what I mean by that is often wrongly, deacons are consider, considered the governing body of the local church. Deacons, however, are meant to care for the needs of the people. They're, they're intended for benevolence use, especially those of the, wed- the widows in Acts 6. The choosing of such men from the congregation was for the purpose of allowing elders to focus on prayer and the ministry of the word. So a church that seeks to transition from a congregationalist model to an elder-led model might struggle since the focus of ministry is vastly different. I grew up in a church, like many Southern Baptist churches, where the deacons 
seemed to govern the church. That is incorrect. That is improper. That is not a New Testament model. The body of Christ is not designed as an organization of individuals doing what they wish because the church is a living organism that should function in unity and harmony with one another. In the same method, the board of elders, as an extension of the local church, should lead the congregation in the unity of the Spirit. Even in churches where transition to an elder-led model is necessary, unity offers a stark reality that is only possible in the Spirit of God. Often, churches discover little opposition in the transition to an elder-led model which is likely due to the transition process itself. In other words, the local congregation has entrusted elders with leadership decisions and has resolved to allow them to lead in such a manner. Elders are also responsible uh, for making day-to-day decisions in order to avoid the unwieldy task of taking every decision directly to the congregation. A congregation cannot focus on the work of ministry if they do that. So, as individual believers are not meant to live the Christian life alone, the local church is not meant to function in ministry alone. This is why local churches are given elders, to lead them in the ways of the Lord In this way, the board of elders most represents the body of Christ. The third support for an elder-led church leadership. This is the final reason I contend for an elder-led model. This type of model... The elder-led model involves a tried-and-true approach to church leadership. For centuries, an elder-led model has uh, been the typical model employed by local churches. In fact, the Congregationalist model, so often utilized in modern churches, was not employed until the 16th and 17th centuries. In the Shepherd of Hermas, a team of elders is described as directing the congregation. Uh, People bring questions to the elders, seeking insight, and the poor elders are responsible, along with the deacons, for caring for the widows, the orphans, and the poor. The elders are distinguished from other church members and are given honored seats in the congregation. They're not more important, but it is a higher calling. The usual polity employed by local churches, however, has been elder-led for centuries. And for this reason, the elder-led model is a tried and tested approach to the ministry of the local church. And church history should be heavenly considered in matters of church polity. The elder-led model holds centuries of ecclesiastical use and praxis. Time-tested and church-tried, the elder-led model has proven effective over time. And so why do we need to change anything if it is already proven to be effective? When offered as a theological argument, From a biblical perspective, one might wonder why the local church would ever deviate from the historic and theological roots of the elder-led model. In response, I offered three supports that are offered for the tried-and-true approach to elder-led polity. Number one is going to be the historical support. Number two the theological support, and number three, the practical support. First is the historical support. Some might argue that every church 
has both elders, a small group of governing officials from among its body, and every church has congregational rule for uh, because the ministry of the church will not continue without the blessing of the congregation. But the elder-led model fits the New Testament polity in a broad sense, in that, number one, all believers in a given city were referred to as uh, were referred to as the church in the city, uh, and they were led by, by that board of elders. So the church at Corinth, the ter- church at Thessalonica. Number two, a plurality of elders oversaw the church in each city. Number three, the New Testament church met in houses. Number four, Each house church had an elder, at least one elder. And number five, the elders did ministry together, so they were not exempt from the work of ministry. Such is the model of the early church, but to understand the historical significance of eldership, its origin needs to be considered. An elder-led model is not a dismissal of pastoral responsibility because throughout history, God has appointed singular men to exercise leadership over God's people. So the elder-led model merely enhances leadership rather than dismissing it. I contend that a board of elders is a plurality. In other words, a body of leaders with equal weight in governing matters of the local church. As a matter of church history, since the New Testament is is to be the model of ecclesiastical function, it should be noted that the New Testament evidence itself seems to favor a plurality, plurality of elders as the standard model. The book of Acts tells us that as the, the apostles planted churches, they appointed elders to oversee them. Likewise, Titus is told to appoint elders in every town, in every city. So as the New Testament is, uh, leans heavily toward the elderly model, so also should the modern church. God has reasons for instructing the elderly model um, not the least of which are its practical and multifaceted um, advantages in the local church's functions as a harmonious body of Christ. A board of elders aids in ensuring that the body of Christ carries out acts of ministry in a unified manner. So since not every believer may agree on every single issue, Contrarily, believers, all believers in the unity of the Spirit can and should function in harmony with one another as they are led by a multiplicity who lead as an extension of their local dynamics. Every church is different. Every church has different dynamics. So there also exists a theological support for an elder-led model of church polity. God is a God of order, 1 Corinthians 14, and he has designed his bride, the church, to be a body of order. This is why the Apostle Paul discusses unity within the body to a great extent. Even in the triune Godhead, there is an order. I've talked about this before, the order of Father, Son, and Spirit. And each member functions with a distinct role. In the same fashion, God has designed his church to operate in a clearly organized way and thus has given her elders, uh, he's placed elders within each, each congregation, through which the Spirit-empowered leadership and decisions may flow. On a theological premise of a God order who ordains 
that is, people perform in a manner he sees fit, the best fit for church policy uh, polity in the New Testament appears to be an elder-led means. Additionally, theological support for the elder-led model has roots in election. No, no, he mentioned the E word. <laughs> a congregation is not without obligation to the selection of elders because the local church is tasked with the choosing of the elders who will lead among them. The obligation to choose from among them grants believers the role of praying and vetting candidates to lead them. As God has a purpose in the election of his saints, a congregation must resolve with intent to honor God in the election of her leaders. A congregation's requirement to choose from among them elders does not negate the responsibility to serve. In fact, the purpose of the local church's selection of leaders is to enhance the ministry of the local church. So the election of leaders is a vital component of local church ministry. As a matter of practical advantages, the elder-led model to church polity again holds a fast connection to New Testament origins. As is the case of Moses and Jethro in Exodus 18, a body of elders works better than a singular person leading God's people because the various gifts dispersed among the body enhance the ministry of the local church. Where one person's gifts lack, another's offers strengths. In a practical way, then, God's people are representative by, uh, represented by their leaders and ministry is enhanced because everyone has different gifts. An elder-led model lacks no historical, theological, and practical support, which leads to an overarching pontification of why a New Testament church would not adhere to the principles set by God in Scripture. The elder-led model has been a tried-and-true method of church polity for centuries, and especially in the early church. Furthermore, its manifestation as a plurality of elders most displays the model of the New Testament. With historical, theological, and practical support, while churches have wavered from their New Testament origins— Local congregations should resolve with haste to, to conform to the most apparent New Testament model, namely the elder-led model. So, okay, I am going to interplay here between the elder-led model and the congregationalist model. The interplay here is between, between the model of the New Testament and congregationalism. Congregationalism arose in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. It occupies a theological position somewhere between Presbyterianism and the radical Protestantism of the Baptists and Quakers. <laughs> you may you may find that a little bit disturbing that I'm referring to um, radical Protestantism of Baptists and Quakers, <laughs> but at the time it was considered very radical. Most Congregationalist churches function in an autonomous manner. A, a larger governing body does not preside over local church functions or ministries. Although it was not always true in the early days of America, Congregationalists have generally been distrustful of state establishment of religion and have worked for civil and religious liberty. Their emphasis on the rights of the particular congregation, um, on freedom and conscience, arose from strong convictions concerning the sovereignty of God and the priesthood of all believers. This attitude has led many of them to adopt theological and social liberalism. 
<laughs> Hear me on that. You heard that right. Liberalism. And um, to participate in ecumenical movement. Within the bounds of Congregationalist polity, two primary issues persist due to its autonomous and liberal nature. Number one, within Congregationalism uh, subsists little structure for accountability and uh, le- among its leadership. And number two, too much responsibility is placed upon uh, one person who functions much like a CEO. So these matters are going to be discussed and boost the case for an elder-led polity in local churches. First, congregationalism possesses an inherent lack of accountability among its leaders, at least more than an elder-led model. Many congregationalist structures accomplish the work of ministry through committees and small teams where individuals are gifted. This allows, number one, pastors and elders to lead the congregation, and number two, congregates to serve in the work of ministry where they are called. An apparent difficulty exists in congregationalism in that leaders are often not, not allowed to lead in the manner God has called them to. Since they are uh, pastors called to lead specific congregations, the local church should allow them to lead. This difficulty is not likely, not as likely to occur, to occur in an elder-led model since the congregation is ruled by a plurality of elders under the lordship of Christ. Often congregationalist models employ a singular pastor or elder or a small group of of pastors, which creates situations in which little accountability is left upon local church leaders. Left unchecked, the human heart has a proclivity to pursue sin. You and I have a proclivity to pursue sin, always. Furthermore, a persistent issue among congregationalist context is the misuse of deacons. Deacons are given for the specific tasks of benevolence. In many congregationalist contexts, however, the deacon body is utilized as an accountability board and a sounding board for the pastor. In elder-led churches, there is usually a clear distinction between elders and deacons and their roles. A further issue in congregationalist churches is that too much responsibility is placed upon one person, namely the pastor or the so-called senior pastor. As was the case with Moses, The responsibility needs to be delegated and shared between leaders who are spiritually gifted to do so. Otherwise, the weight of work is exceedingly great, which is not intended for one person or even a few people to accomplish. In the book book of Acts, deacons were given to the church for the purpose of benevolence so that elders could focus on their primary task, prayer and the ministry of the word. From this designation, it should be, it should be assumed that the primary responsibility of an elder is twofold in that regard, prayer and the ministry of the word. So to truly be a good pastor according to the standards of the Lord one might be considered one might risk be consi- being considered bad from the perspective of the congregants prayer and the ministry of the word is perhaps the reason that paul distinguishes the role of deacons from the role of elders still the responsibility of church governance should be delegated delegated to the pl- plurality of elders rather than a singular person. Deacons, uh, the Apostle Paul, does not give the responsibility to teach, but for elders, he does. 
The two issues that persist most commonly in the Congregationalist settings are little accountability and too much responsibility placed on one person. An elder-led model solves much in the way of these two issues. In opposition to the shortcomings of Congregationalism, then, the argument for elder-led rule is enhanced and should be accepted as the best New Testament model. So, this is a case for elder-led polity. The body of Christ is a single and living organism designed to model itself after the teachings of the New Testament. So, the most fundamentally sound model for the church is the elder-led model. Moreover, the elder-led model that employs a plurality of elders is the most relevant New Testament teaching. The problems that exist surrounding the commonly utilized Congregationalist model may be largely solved by implementation of an elder-led model. Further, the elder-led model works best because of its natural accountability structures. A biblical elder-led model also naturally and accurately reflects the body of Christ and has been tried and true for centuries since the early church. As the best New Testament model, local churches should strive to imitate such structures, and when absent, when they don't exist, they should speedily conform to the New Testament model as a reflection of unity in the body of Christ. For this reason, I contend that the elder-led model that functions as a plurality of elders is the best model offered to the, new, to the modern church. We are the New Testament church. We should function as a New Testament church. I hope this has been helpful as we consider matters of church polity and how how a church is to function uh, practically. The elder-led model. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones.